Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Turn off that too. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Again, it's a pretty warm day today, back east and down south, I guess. These people are in a very miserable situation. But anyway, um, what we're going to do today, we've got two guests. Uh, the first 30 minutes, we're going to talk about mental illness. And the second, we're going to get sort of an update uh, from a dear friend, Ron Buell, who's going to give us an update on CRC, Columbia River Crossing. And uh, it's my understanding he's getting ready to put together another media source through the, through the website. It's very interesting. As you know, um, Ron uh, was, the, was the guy who basically put together the Willamette Week. So it's going to be very interesting to kind of get a sense of where is he going with that piece, okay? But okay, but starting off with, why don't we just uh, get right into this mental illness aspect of it. As you know, we've had some high-profile cases here in the, in the city of Portland, and mental illness is, is definitely a, a major issue here in the state of Oregon for that matter, because at one point in time, uh, damage used to be here. You know, it was one of the largest uh, institutions we had in the state. And as you know, uh, developers came in and they basically closed it up, and and now basically the the clinics, if you will, and and uh, are basically on the streets, and, and that's 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 a problem. I think it's a problem. There's the issue between uh, law enforcement and mental illness, and um, again, they are constantly doing one thing, and at the same time being asked to be clinical psychologists, and that's that's a toughie. And so anyway, what we're going to do is that uh, my guest today hopefully will maybe get into answering some of those questions and, and the like, and, and I think it's going to be really a pleasure. So Aisha, welcome aboard. Thank you. Oregon Voters Thank Digest. You. Okay, a little, little background on, on Aisha. I'll just throw this out, and if, if, I, if I've missed anything, Aisha will probably bring, <laughs> bring up the rest of it. But anyway, <laughs> it's Aisha Edwards. Um, uh, she's, uh, she's gotten her degree, a master's in clinical, uh, in clinical psychology from Pacific University, okay? And uh, she worked clinically with uh, the community of color since 2007, kind of like sp uh, specifying specifically in African Americans, in uh, that matter. And uh, she's also done research with minority communities since 2002, within this community for that matter, city of Portland. Mm -hmm. And also she co-authored guidelines for multicultural interviewing. Okay, and I thought that was an interesting piece. We'll get a little bit of that more. Mm -hmm. And currently works in in private practice. She works currently mm -hmm. working in private practice, and she'll give us a feel for who she's working for, and uh, and we'll go from there. But I've I've sort of outlined some questions that I've uh, I've worked with her because I want to make sure we get down to specifics, and then if time permits, I'll I'll ask a few more questions, mm -hmm. and again, if time even permits even more, we'll open up the line, and then maybe you might want to ask her a question or two. Okay. And again, as, as I've always said, be brief, all right? Okay, uh, the first question I would ask you, Aisha, would be, why do you think culturally, mentally, health services for African Americans are so important? Well, I think that there is a lot of elements that we have to look at first. And I think that one of the most important elements that we have to look at, Bruce, is the fact that, I mean, there's many sociological studies and research and sort of dialogue about the fact that uh, psychology and social work can be used as tools for social control. Um, and what I mean to say is that it can be uh, an environment that assists, that kind of uh, focuses individuals to behave in line with what our, our social systems want. And so we really, as providers, have a very strong role uh, to understand uh, culturally diverse backgrounds and provide services that are in line with what the mores of that culture um, you know, have in store for that individual. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah makes sense. So I think you know, that is really the, the first piece that is really the foundation here is that we as providers really do have a, a significant responsibility to the communities that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, the second piece is that African Americans specifically, because of the history of oppression, um, the history of uh, these, these institutions like you know, uh, psychology and social work, um, having wronged uh, our people for such a long period of time, um, African Americans really do have very special needs compared to uh, the rest of the, the sort of dominant Caucasian population. Um, some of the risk factors that come from culturally incompetent services are things like uh, overdiagnosis. So for example, if you uh, had 
you know, a Caucasian individual and an African American individual uh, with the same symptom set, the same symptom presentation, the African American is more likely to be overdiagnosed and therefore overtreated than the Caucasian individual. Um, so overtreated would could result in something like hospitalization, uh, higher levels of medications, uh, you know, intensive treatment that is unnecessary. Uh, so these are factors that we really need to take into account when we're talking about services. Beyond that, there are some elements like, for example, if, uh, if you're working, if an African American is working with a clinician, uh, whether the clinician is white or another person of color, who doesn't understand uh, that culture in and of itself. The likelihood that that person is going to steer them toward culturally inappropriate um, behavior sets and then sort of put that person in a position of being alienated from their own group is very high. Um, what's more is that person who, that, that uh, clinician who is culturally incompetent is more likely to do more damage in terms of traumatizing this individual or alienating them from services uh, so that that individual is not actually ever getting the help that they need to um, you know, be a productive member of their community again. You know, when you were pursuing these studies mm -hmm. at Pacific University, mm -hmm. did they have these kind of discussions among the entire class? I mean, yes. you were specifically yes. looking at that culture, right, mm -hmm. specifically, and I take it you went mm -hmm. to Pacific specifically for that, right? I did, I did. Um, Pacific has a human diversity program mm -hmm. uh, that I was specifically interested in, in, which is why I went there. But overall, mental health services over the last 20 years have um, really highlighted cultural competency. Uh, cultural competency is seen as the fourth force in psychology and in counseling. Um, there are many, 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 many extensive studies on, um, you know, providing uh, intercultural, uh, interculturally appropriate services. Um, one of the biggest names uh, would be uh, uh, Daryl Wing Su, uh, who's up at um, uh, UW. Uh, and so there are, there are many names who are out there trying to promote this. But the problem is, there, for me, in my experience with working with other clinicians, particularly white clinicians, mm -hmm. is there is a gap between what we understand uh, cerebrally, what we understand academically, and how that actually manifests on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that is really what my biggest concern as a clinician is, is how these things actually manifest on a day-to-day -day basis. How cultural competency looks in the room, sitting down with a client yeah, in the moment. Okay, you're out there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, all right, all right. Let's get a second question. What yeah. makes African Americans' needs in counseling different than other groups? Why yeah. is there such a need? Yeah, well, I feel here that one of the best things that I can do is actually cite someone else. Um, someone who is local, her name is Joy Leary. Um, she works at uh, uh, PSU and she is in the uh, social work program. African American. Mm -hmm. African American woman, part of our community right mm -hmm. here in Portland. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, she wrote a book called Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And one of the, uh, ama I mean, the, the book is amazing. So, you know, first of all, I just want to recommend anybody out there, go, go pick up this book and, and read more about what makes Af the Am African American psyche uh, different than, than those other, you know, populations uh, in our area. And, you know, the book really holds that uh, after hundreds and hundreds of years of oppression and degradation and uh, you know, slavery and, you know, pseudo slavery um, that has continued and continued for upon generation and generation, that these things are traumas. And when we think about, uh, you know, uh, 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 someone in the military going off to war and experiencing war and the trauma of war, they come back and they potentially, if, you know, they were not able to to traverse that trauma well, mm -hmm. um, they come back and potentially are diagnosed with PTSD, which would be post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, if you think about those traumas happening over and over and over and over again in one's lifetime across the entire population, across generation and generation and generation, there becomes a sort of legacy of trauma that is instilled in the community that is not only uh, within the very fabric of the culture, but it, it is also embedded in every individual psyche as well. And if we don't take the time 
to actually piece those elements apart within the individual to create resilience, to improve protective factors, to strengthen uh, the individual, the relationships, the, the families, and the community as a whole, we're you know, really just not doing what we're supposed to do as clinicians. We're not, uh, in my mind, creating an overall quality of life uh, that can radically change, I think, our, our community as a whole across the nation. Okay, okay. Let's take another one here. What is the current approach to services in Multnomah County? Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts about mm -hmm. this? Well, about those I want to say, Bruce, I can only speak to my experience working as a clinician in community mental health in Multnomah County. So I can't speak to, you know, what sort of happens behind closed doors now, what, in the what are you saying that, that meaning that the clients are assigned to you sure. through, through the industry sure, that you're sure. working with, right? Sure. So I don't, so I, I don't want to say anything about the sort of um, overall sort right. of minute policy decisions. Right. But what I can say is that one thing that I find about Multnomah County and, and maybe the state of Oregon in general that is very strange to me is that we provide culture-specific services. And on the outset, theoretically, culture-specific services seems like a great idea. Mm -hmm. You know, It seems like it should be really uh, providing what our community needs because it's populated by folks who are folks of color and you know, et cetera, et cetera. But on the ground, what I've seen as a clinician is that often culture-specific services can be called ghettoized services. Mm. Yeah. Can you um, expand on that? Yes, please, I would love to. Yeah, what, 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 what does that mean? <laughs> What I, what I, I mean, there is an element that is uh, in part related to HMOs and how HMOs have really plagued HMOs, mental health, what was, what was um, health management organizations. Okay. So when we talk about HMOs, we're talking about organizations like Kaiser, organizations that pay for the services. Okay. And these organizations are businesses. At the end of the day, these organizations are at, you know, primarily interested in making a buck. Okay. And the ways that they go about doing that are in direct opposition to what actually, you know, in my mind, uh, qualifies as quality services. So, I mean, examples of this would be things like, you know, d double booking clients, um, you know, pushing, 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 always making more and more and more money off of the client, mm -hmm. um, uh, limiting the amount of services that someone can get, um, uh, limiting the uh, range of what a clinician can do. These sorts of things are across the board, whether it's in the African American community or outside of mm -hmm. that, um, something that HMOs have done to mental health services. So you have that level, and then our community mental health agencies needing to be responsive to HMO demands. So that puts our, our agencies in these places where they li literally just have to bend over and take whatever the demands of these you know, funding bodies are going to say. So from that, it creates this trickle down of um, you know, what administrators are, are willing to do because the fear of scarcity of resources, right? We don't want to lose our funding. We don't want to lose our funding. So we have to do all these things to make this, this uh, funding body happy. I mean, kind of, we can call it the master. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we have to do all these things mm -hmm. to make this funding body happy. And then that limits what, in essence, you can really do on the ground mm -hmm. with, with clients. So if you go beyond there to actually what's specific to the African American community, there are some other problems as well that kind of manifest, I think, in some of these organizations. One, because they're generally mismanaged, which I, I could talk about for days. Mm -hmm. Two, because a lot of times what, what, what these organizations wind up doing is they wind up hiring staff just because they're black. Mm not because the staff are actually competent mm -hmm. or even culturally mm -hmm. culturally competent because there's this assumption that because you're black you must be culturally competent mm -hmm. but that's not actually true right. Right. you know okay. and and so what i've seen is you know this this rampant incompetence in staff providing terrible services to clients whose livelihoods i mean for example the one of the programs that i worked for was an addictions program in which the majority of the clients are mandated to services through child protective services and if they don't follow through on all of the elements of their treatment we'll lose their children this program is a, a program specifically for african-american yes hmm. so 
you have these <laughs> this like this like terrible quality of services with folks who are then being traumatized and re-traumatized